Okay. We're able so to do that. Yeah. Great. All right. So we are recording now um, and we can get started. Uh, Jane, just let me know. Um, I had to reclaim being host. So if okay. be able to share your screen, but if you have any issues, we'll just make you host again and we'll navigate that as we go. But uh, welcome everyone to the Central Network of Care meeting. Um, I know that we had quite um, a large group of folks registered for this uh, meeting slash training. So, um, you know, as you come on, um, feel free to um, put any questions or um, any introductions that you may have missed into the chat. Um, but we don't want to let too much time go by because um, we only have an hour and a half time slot. So um, let me just introduce myself. My name is Ann Petiti. Um, I am the Network of Care Manager for Region 6, Central Region um, from Beacon Health Options. Um, we do four of these uh, Network of Care meetings a year. Um, and we sometimes have discussions about, you know, barriers um, and other things that are happening in our region. And sometimes we have um, presentations. So we are lucky enough to have a presentation today um, by CPAC um, on the um, updates or the changes to the IEP form. Um, so CPAC is going to introduce themselves and they will get into it, um, into their presentation. And then um, hopefully at the end, we will have time for um, questions. Um, Jane, I'm not sure if uh, that works best for you for people to hold their questions until the end, or if it's easier to, if they put them into the chat um, as we go, and then we can address them at the end, um, whatever works best for you. Um, I usually like to start with people being able to unmute and ask their questions. And then if we start to get behind, then we can save them till the end. But it, if we can ask them as they come up, sometimes they're just more relevant and we can answer your question while you're having you know, the, the question. Um, so we'll do our best to try that. Um, so I'm Jane from the Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center. Lisa's with me today as well. And we're both going to be talking about this and we will we'll try to answer your questions. We would like folks to keep the questions as broad and not personal as possible because this is an open forum and your children's confidentiality is important to us. So if you have individual specific questions, we do have a call center and we'd be happy to talk to you. Um, but in the meantime, questions about the content we're talking about today would be great. All right, wonderful. So um, as, you, as you heard, we will do questions as they come. And then um, if we need to, we can address more at the end. And um, just before um, they get started with their presentation, I will stop uh, screen sharing so you guys can pull your presentation up. But I just wanna remind folks um, to please keep yourself on mute um, unless you have a question, then come off just because we are expecting um, a large number of folks on this call. So just so there's no interruptions with the presentation, that would be, that would be great. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing and um, we will let Jane and crew get into uh, their presentation. Great. So somebody did ask for our phone number. Lisa's putting it, Jennifer's putting it in the, in the chat. So it's right there. Um, where is my PowerPoint? There it is. And let me go to not be printing. Does everyone see the slide? Cynthia, I see you nodding. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. All right, so let's get started. So um, I'm going to start. Lisa is with me today, too. Lisa, did you want to say a few words before we start? Hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Opert. I'm a parent consultant with Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center, um, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, Jane, I don't know if you want to um, share it, so, like hit the share. There you go. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I did change the format. And everybody so can still see it. Sounds like Lisa could. So today we're talking about getting to know your child's IEP. And the first question we had already was, it, has the IEP changed in the last few years? Um, it's changing now. It changed this summer. Last year, there was a pilot for it um, with 20 districts that trialed it. And now it's officially here. So it is a brand new form. And so we're going to talk about the form today. That's one of the pieces we're going to do. Um, but first, let me tell you a little bit about who we are, and then we'll get into the presentation. So the Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center is actually a parent training and information center. 
And it's kind of important that we clarify that because the word advocacy in our title um, is sometimes misleading. We do help parents and anyone who wants to learn how to advocate for children with disabilities. It's our job to provide training and information on those topics. We are statewide. We offer our services across the state and they're pretty much related to support related to special education. We do have a, um, a partner in Hartford called AFCAMP, Advocacy for Children, and they are they kind of do what we do for the region of Hartford, it's unique to that, but we're the statewide group. Um, all of our program staff are either individuals with disabilities or parents of children with disabilities themselves. So we all walk the walk in one way or another. Some of the partners we have in all of the work we do, we work with the Down Syndrome Association of Connecticut, we, we are part of the State Family Engagement Center, which is disability and non-disability. Um, the Department of Education, United States is our primary identity, which is the Training and Information Center. We work with birth to three. Lisa does um, both works with parents and works with professionals in birth to three. And the State Department of Education, we work with, and this is their IEP. And we work with them very closely. A little bit more about CPAC, the, this is our mission and our vision. Really what our job is to help all families, regardless of who they are, what their needs are, to have the confidence, knowledge, and understanding to effectively advocate for their children and to partner with professionals. So it's really important people understand our direction is very much one of collaboration. And so again, the term advocacy sometimes is misleading. Some people perceive that as adversarial, but we're actually here to help people have really positive relationships together. Um, and our, our goal is to educate, support, and empower all of Connecticut's diverse families of children and youth with any disability or chronic condition, birth to 26. And we always work with the professionals who serve them. So in that context, that's who CPAC is. These are the things we're gonna talk about today. Participants will learn the components of the IEP. So we're gonna talk about what makes up an IEP in any IEP in any state. We're gonna get an introduction to our new form, which was effective July 1st, 2022. So we'll talk about when people will start seeing that. And we're gonna hoping that people get an understanding of where to find pertinent information in the IEP when you're looking for it. We get a lot of families who call us and have questions and we can often answer that by having them pull out their IEP and we walk them through it to find the answer in the IEP to what they're looking for. So that's our goal for today is to help people be, it'll be easier to read your child's IEP. So I'm gonna jump in here and let's talk about what an IEP actually is. Um, IEP is the acronym that stands for the Individual Education Program. It's the written plan that details each child's special education and related services. Um, it is at the core of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, often referred to as IDEA. Um, it is the legal document that really shows us what this child's special education program is going to look like. Um, all children receiving special education services have an IEP. That doesn't matter if they have one half hour of speech a week or they're an outplaced student. All students that are receiving any type of special education will have an IEP. Um, and that IEP must be reviewed annually. And there's a couple of questions in here. Um, so let's look at what those are quickly. Um, would you be willing, able to send a copy of your PowerPoint via email? I think, yeah, I think that's not a problem at all. Um, for the question on bullying, check out this. Oh, somebody had a question on bullying and Jen, and Jen sent that in there. Thank you so much. So is a 504 plan a more mild form of an IEP? No, a 504 is actually uh, like a civil rights law. So it's really protecting a student with a disability. The difference is, is that a child with an IEP, that child's disability is impacting their access to general education. So that disability impacts them so much so that they need, they require specialized instruction. So it's a little bit different, um, but it has accommodations in it. Um, it has some similar things, but an IEP has specialized instruction. So it's a little bit different than a 504. 
Right, so both can have accommodations, as Lisa said. So a 504 would be a plan of accommodations, but no specialized instruction. So for example, a student with dyslexia might need um, specialized reading instruction in order to benefit from their program. Um, and the accommodations can be in an IEP or a 504, but the biggest difference is that special need for specialized instruction. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. You want me to move along or? Uh, sure. Gonna... That'd be great. I think there was a question uh, to Alicia. Did you have a question? Where it says up till 26, does, <laughs> that's not for schools, is it? No, nope. that's our 20, services. Yeah, that's just Connecticut that's Parent Advocacy Services. services. Okay. Yep, okay. the public school is up through 22. Up to 22, okay. Yep. I thought it was 21. It's gone up. It just 21. changed, la not this past summer, the summer prior. Okay. Um, it went to the 22nd birthday now. Thank you. Of course. Um, so the new IEP form in Connecticut, it's pretty exciting. It started July 1st, 2022 with completely new forms. Uh, the goal of these new forms is to improve the quality of IEPs in Connecticut. Um, the big difference is when we talk about IEPs, previously we would say, hey, turn to page eight, turn to page 11, and, and it's no longer that way. So it's going to be dealing in sections. So you'll hear us refer to sections as opposed to pages. Uh, parents will only get the sections that apply to their child. So for example, if your child is just coming out of pre-K and maybe in kindergarten, first grade, you are not going to be receiving the transition sections because that doesn't happen till about 13, 14 years old. Um, but if your child, if your child has a reading disability, but their math is grade level and they do not receive services, you will not have anything under math. It'll just be your reading goals. So things that pertain specifically to your student will be on your IEP. Um, so they will not, it will not be the complete form that you see here. You might not see everything on your IEP. Um, the additional piece that's very different is that there's three pieces that are now no longer in the IEP. Prior written notice is its own document. Um, we'll talk about that towards the end, so don't worry, we'll get to it. Uh, the record of meeting um, is an, its own document. And then the summary that was always within the IEP is now uh, a separate document as well, but it really is just kind of like a loose leaf paper for us to fill in. Um, but there are three separate documents in addition to the IEP. So we can go to the next one, please. Um, what's very different and very new is CT SEDS. Um, so Connecticut Special Education Data System is what CT SEDS stands for. Um, it's a new system of data collection for all students with IEPs. What's great about it is that there are links to the parent portal. It has a parent portal for parents will be able to get access to their children's IEP from, from a computer, from a tablet, from their phone, um, with their personal access code. Their personal access code changes every time a parent has to log into the portal. What's great about that is that if you are uh, away on vacation and you need to check something, just say, um, you can just request a new. Um, access code, it comes in either an email, uh, somebody will call you with your email, with, with your access code, or it can come within a text. It's all up to the parent's preference. Um, don't share that access code with other people. Um, but there's, it, some data is collected and stored within the IEP, but not printed in the IEP. For example, language of the family. Um, what's also great is that you can take from CT SEDS, you can download your IEPs, save it to your personal devices so that you have access to it at any time. At Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center, families will often wanna share IEPs for us to review and kind of help them understand it um, when there's questions. And sometimes it's really complicated. I think this will make it a lot easier to share information within programs. Um, yeah, um, and there was a couple of questions. Let me just see what they are. Um, does that include access to the prior written notice? Yes, it does. That'll be in the parent portal. Uh, you'll have access to those and the other documents that are no longer attached to the IEP itself. Yes, all of those will be documented at the evaluations will not, but uh, prior written notice, um, summary, if it's there, and I can't remember the other one off the top. Consents. 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 Yep. So all consents will be signed through there. 
for evaluations, all of that will be listed. So sometimes you'll go away and say, I don't remember what I signed consent for. You'll be able to have access to those things at any time in the portal. Um, how can the providers that are working with families receive the IEP tree view? So families can, again, download their IEPs from the portal and share with you at their discretion. And that would be preferable. The, the access code, my understanding of the access code, and, and it's all new to all of us, so please bear with us, is that it's kind of like if you if anybody does online banking. Every time I go to log into my bank, I get, or, or sometimes my email, they want to verify. It's like a verification code. So every time you go in, they want you to verify. Something we also learned about the portal is it documents everybody's time in it. So if you're going in, Repeatedly, it shows up in a log that you've been in and you've viewed those things. And I, I only share that because I think parents would want to know that, you know, that that when they're in the portal, their time, what they're doing is being logged. I believe the same is true for professionals as well. I think it's just the nature of the data collection system. But we were told that there is a log of, of entry that is visible. Welcome. Lisa, are you ready for me to move on? Or you have Yes, please. Okay. So this is the section, remember not page, we're talking sections now, um, that includes your, your student information. So this is all the student information that was on the previous one. Um, it looks fairly similar, to be honest with you, um, but it's not so squished in, which I kind of like. The, it just feels like there's more room. So it'll have your student name, the meeting date, your student ID, the case manager is important thing. So if you don't know who to contact, look on this first section and that's who you contact if you have questions. That's also who you have contact um, if, there's a if there's a problem in CT sets, you contact your uh, case manager. So it has the child's date of birth, the parent guardian name, uh, current grade, and the primary disability. We're gonna look at the primary disabilities that are can be under there in just a moment, but there's 13 federal primary disability labels. Um, or identifications, and there's two specific to Connecticut, which we'll talk about. Um, but it will not, the new form does not give all of those. So it's, I suggest coming, becoming familiar with what those options are, um, just in case you think maybe your child falls under, some, under something different than what they're currently uh, labeled as their primary disability. Um, the current school enrolled, school next year. So if it's a transition year, you'll have those two listed. Uh, the most recent evaluation dates. And remember that we do evaluations every three years or triennial evaluations. So there should be most recent and then three years later that you'll have the next reevaluation date, your most recent annual review, and then the next year that it's going to happen. So that has to be done before. And if there's a surrogate parent that is mentioned here. Uh, the reason for meeting, can be a number of different things. It can be um, initial referrals. It could be uh, determining eligibility, evaluations, um, any of those implementing the IEP. It could be many of the things. I think there was about nine on the old forms of IEP. You will only see the reason for the meetings that are pertaining to that specific meeting. So if it's your initial IEP, or you've never been to a PPT meeting before, it's going to say your initial PPT, your referral, um, discussion about evaluations, whatever those codes are, but those are what you'll see there. Um, so remember, not all disability categories are shown on this document. It's only going to be the one that's determined by the team that the primary disability. And these are those categories. Um, so there's 13 federal, uh, there's two specific to Connecticut. You can take a screenshot of this if you'd like, or we'll be sending it out after if you'd like. Um, the two Connecticut specific are OHI or other health impairments, specifically ADHD and ADD. Uh, the next is SLD dyslexia. So it's a uh, specific learning disability dyslexia. Um, and then another change I wanted to just note is that um, in Connecticut ED label, it was formerly known as emotionally disturbance. Connecticut's changed to emotional disability. Uh, so I just, I think it's a more respectful thing, and I'm actually quite happy about the change. Um, but if we can, Lisa, yeah. one of the things I think you pointed out in that first session as kind of a global thing is there's a lot less drop down or a lot less um, listing of things yeah. on the new IEP compared to the old one. So the old one was kind of informative. There was information embedded in the document itself, 
a lot of that's been what's pulled out. So there's a lot of need for other lists and other ways to get information what might go in that box. But that was with the intent of streamlining the document and not having so much print all at once. So there's pros and cons of, of that, of not having the list that help educate. Um, and we have a couple of questions. I just wanted to run back in there okay. if that's okay, Jane. Um, Danielle asks, can a parent also see how long the school team has been logged onto their student documents? I don't believe they can see how long it's been in there. I, I'm going to say I logs. disagree. I think it. I think oh. it does show the duration, but we can we can ask that question. Yeah, that's one. This is fairly new to us as well. We've had. I think we had one training on on what the parents on see. the portal, right? Yeah. So it's fairly new, so we're not really sure. So we can get back to you on that one. Um, the next one is the log of whom accessed the IEP available for the parents to see. That I do believe was on there to see who had access. Um, if a child is involved in DCF and is a foster home, will the both foster and biological parents have access to the records of an access code? That would be the surrogate parent would be the person that really is going into it, um, depending on the situation from what I understand. I don't believe foster, foster yeah. parents have uh, access to those things. I think it's really the surrogate parent that would have that. Um, and then uh, Ms. Rivera asked, after five years old, what does developmental delay turn into in regards to a category? Um, so that's when you go to um, your team and say, okay, listen, he's five, he's gonna be six. What are we gonna do? What, what is his primary disability going to be on this one? And you're gonna go through checklists and you're gonna talk as a team and determine um, what you think the best category will be for him of those 13 plus the two uh, state. Uh, categories that you can choose from. And there's checklists at the state level that you can have access to uh, for most, if not all. Um, so then we have our PPT, pre uh, PPT members present. So at the PPT, it used to kind of have like little squishy pages. You had to fill everyone's name in and it was complicated. This I really like because it allows for as many people, it gets bigger as you need, or it can be as small as your team is small. Um, I want you to remember though that uh, there must be an administrator in your PPTs. There must be somebody who's able to review evaluations upon request. Um, there must be a special education teacher as well as a general education teacher in attendance for this PPT to be um, moving forward. So you wanna make sure that those four people are there. Parents can be listed there. Any parent that if you wanna bring somebody just as like an emotional support or a note taker, they could be on here too. Um, so as many people as needed and their role is identified. Um, yeah. So if we can go to the next one. And then amendments. This is one change that I really love to this one. Um, as a parent of a kid who's had amendments, I could not tell you where I would see those in my IEP previously. Um, I would ask for the updated IEP, but it would have to be like looking through with a fine tooth comb to find that change. Uh, this one, the amendment, um, first of all, an amendment is uh, a change to the IEP made outside of a PPT meeting. And that can only happen when the family and the school team determine that that's what we agree to do. So it can't be one person saying, yeah, we're gonna make this change. Everybody has to be in agreement. There's forms to, to fill out, to complete it. What I love about it is that this tells you the amendment implementation, implementation date, I always mess that one up. Um, the following sections were in the, of the IEP were amended. So it tells you the section name and the text that changed. So you could see very clearly what changes were made. So there's no kind of um, second guessing or searching endlessly for these, you know, sometimes just a simple number change. Uh, so I really like that about this one. Yeah. So remember, amendments have to be agreed upon before between everybody. And then we can go to the next page. I am trying to move it, but it is not moving. I'm not sure why. Oh, there we go. Oh, perfect. Um, so our PPT recommendations. Um, so our planning and placement team and recommendations. It used to be uh, like page two, it's just a list of, it's the same list, it's just not on page, it's its own section. This is where you talk about um, 
and any evaluations that you plan to conduct or that you review uh, that you plan to conduct, service hour recommendations, changes in placement, any of those things. Sometimes it's just like, let's implement the IEP. So sometimes it has a big long list of recommendations and sometimes it's just a couple, both are valid. So this is where you'll find those. Okay, any questions on the PPT recommendations? All right. Then I'm gonna take over for the special factors or considerations. Um, this, the idea behind this anyway is really terrific. Um, in IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, they require that these questions be asked for every student. Does the student exhibit behaviors that impede their learning of, for themselves or others? This was on the existing, the previous IEP. It's just laid out a little bit differently here. Um, there's whether the student is deaf or hard of hearing. Is the student blind or visually impaired? Does the student have limited English proficiency and qualifies as an EL student? Does the student require accessible educational materials, AEM? Something for students with dyslexia or often um, blind students getting braille would be an um, accessible education material. And does the student require an alternative mode of communication? They're all yes, no questions. And these are really important because they guide so much of the programming. So if you have a yes for any of these, for example, if the student is deaf or hard of hearing, there's a language and communication plan required to be filled out for them. So the, the system, the system for the user that's creating the IEP has to go in and do that language and communication plan before they can finalize the IEP. So it's kind of a nice um, check. I don't know what the right word is. I want like a double check to make sure that the other attached documents that are required are included in the process. Because if the student needs a language and communication plan, it should be being discussed at PPT. And so this gives us a better chance of things like that happening. Um, same thing with the EL students. It will connect with the native language data and the rest of the state system. So there's, it's going to be, when we talk about improving the quality, it will improve the communication about the different needs of the student on a broader level. Um, parent, oh, there's one other thing I wanted to say about that. Let me go back for a second. In IDEA, they also include assistive technology as one that there, that must be a question at the PPT as well. Connecticut put that on a different page. So we're gonna deal with that when we get to supplementary aids and services, but in the law, it is in conjunction with these other questions. For those of you who have familiarity and especially with the last IEP. Um, parent and student input and concerns. There are now actually three sections where you can find the opportunity to share your input and concerns or your students' input and concerns. So when we get into how the IEP is laid out as far as present levels of performance and the goals, you will see that in each section, academic, functional, and transition, there is a spot for you to include, for them to include what you, your input is. And we sometimes recommend that if this is really important to parents, that they present the district with their written version of what their input and concerns are. Um, that's just one tip that sometimes helps to make sure that it reflects what you're really thinking. So this is getting into the present levels of performance. So you can see, we don't have this section here, but um, I'm sorry, it, the concerns and needs are highlighted right there. That's what the students, present level of performance strengths, concerns and needs, and the impact. This is in the existing IEP, but it looks different. And what really was a, an asset here is in the old IEP, present levels were on page five. And then we didn't get to writing the goal about them until page seven. And so now we're doing it all at once. So if the goal area, for example, is chosen at the top, for example, reading, then everything related to that student's present level about reading is the only thing here. And then everything about the student's goal and objectives around that reading need is all on one section together. So it follows much more logically. Um, 
And we also want to point out a new change to this IEP is the Connecticut core standards aligned to this goal will be listed on the IEP itself. I believe that that is not a mandatory use area until next year, um, but that will be a part of this IEP is that the standards being used to, deter to develop the goal will be shared with the family. And then also another change is the related services necessary to achieve this goal are on this goal rather than on a separate page about the related services. So they're really trying to connect the present levels to the goal, to the standard that means this goal is important, to the related services such as speech, OTPT, transportation, whatever is necessary to achieve this goal. I'm gonna pause for a minute because this is a lot. If anybody has any specific questions, I see a question from the disability section. Does audio processing disorder fall under deaf or hard of hearing? Um, typically that falls under learning disability, but that is certainly a conversation you can have with your team. And if you have a diagnosis from an audiologist, you can talk to them. Uh, Talisha, I see your hand. Okay, this is Mary and Gracie again. Um, with regards to the goals and uh, many of the areas of the IEP so far, are these already pre-done when they come to the PPT or are they done as the PPT is going on? So it's a great question. They, the, we, when we had the um, training on the portal, they did tell us that draft goals are possible. So a team can, can create draft goals. It will say draft across them and they could be brought to PPT as in draft form. But the bottom line answer for that question is they're not developed until the whole PPT agrees on them. Um, but I personally like it when somebody gives me a draft goal at the PPT or preferably before the PPT so I can help shape it. Maybe it sounds great, but is that with prompts or without prompting? You know, that kind of a thing. So when you get draft goals, recognize they are changeable, that the team is the one who decides the final goal and the final decision should be made at the PPT meeting. Okay. Does that help? These, are, these are all done um, on a computer during the PPT? They could be, yep. They could be written right there at, by the team. They don't have to come in, in draft form. They could just be created right then and there. Okay. That would be fun. Um, just a question with regards to that. Um, having been in on many PPTs and IPs, I find it very impersonal as a person is typing on a computer, um, filling in these forms. Um, when parents are sitting there, um, I think parents are left, you know, wondering what's going on and kind of left out of the loop. I know that when the forms were being written, um, we'll say with, with script, that it seemed more personal. Um, has there been any kind of consideration for when these PPTs are being done that a secretary or someone in the background, not necessarily as a direct member, but someone to be this the scribe rather than to have someone who is, is initially in this PPT? So I've been to a lot of PPTs and it's never the same person at every PPT. It could be um, somebody that's there just to take notes. I have been at PPTs like that. I have been at PPTs where the special ed teacher is the one writing the IEP. And I've been where the administrator is the one writing the PPT. But I hear what you're saying completely when an important person is behind a screen, it's hard to have a really good relational conversation. So I would say for parents who feel that way, it's perfectly okay to say, can you write the IEP afterwards? Can you just take notes? Can somebody else do it? Um, I've actually been in a PPT where the person taking the notes was a participant, but they were projecting what they were typing on the screen so everybody could see it. That was probably the best PPT I'd ever been to as far as communication about what was being written while we're talking. You know, we could all see it. And so we all could say, oh wait, that wasn't really what we were saying. And we could fix it right then and there. And it was very interactive. So I do think that what you're saying is true is that it's, um, people should be considerate about that. And I think parents could always say, I really would prefer that we have a conversation rather than having to look at, at the screen at the back of your computer. I think it's a perfectly reasonable discussion to have with the team. Thank you. Does that help? And Jane, I just wanted to add, I think that's really, really helpful as a parent 
um, when you're in that PPT and you're hearing all these draft goals just kind of coming at you, it can be really overwhelming and confusing. I always request them a couple of days in advance. I just, I'll just send an email like a week ahead of time and I'll say, hey, any way that I can get those draft goals like two or three days in advance just so I can review them. Um, and then when you get there, you don't also have to spend so much time explaining each one. So if you have questions about them, then you can just kind of ask them specifically. I think it's been really productive of the time in the IEP. If there's things that I think definitely need to change or things I just don't understand, like why are we doing this? It's really important to kind of go um, prepared, at least for myself. So that's an option for you as well. I find the draft goals the most useful thing too, because it, in all honesty, in my experience, my son is now 32, so he hasn't been in a PPT, but I go with other families all the time. And a lot of times the goals are not written at the PPT or coming in, in draft form. So a lot of times it's waiting for the IEP to come to see that how it actually gets captured in words, not just discussion and ideas at a PPT. So when you have the draft in your hand, you have something more tangible than a discussion. So that's just, uh, that's just experience. Well, again, we don't wanna move forward. Not sure why, let's, oh, wants me to say it and then it will do it. Okay, so present levels of performance we were talking about. Um, now we have, so that was the academic area. I'm calling it the academic area. They give you the example of math. Lisa gave you the example before if you, I mean, they gave reading. Um, if you have a student with a reading disability, you don't get the math section. But if you had a student who needed help in both reading and math, you would have that same set for each academic area. And then you get another set for functional performance. And again, another opportunity to list the parent and student input or concern above the goal area. So here they give you, for example, communication. So now we're in the functional realm. Um, social emotional, communication, vocational, health, development, things that were on the second part of this section and the old IEP. Vision, hearing, fine motor, gross motor, activities of daily living. Any of those areas would be, would be the content area for this page. And again, it has the present levels and then right below it, followed by the annual goal and objective related to that area. So if your child is having a lot of trouble learning speech and language, um, the communication section would be documented here. And also you could have more than one goal in all those areas. So it's just showing this, the, the blank slate is just the, showing the one goal under each of them, um, but you can have many. So it's, well, I don't know if you want many, but you can have more than one. Um, it's not limited to just the one goal. So you're saying, Lisa, areas. within communication, you could have more, more than one, but you could right. also have more than one of different areas under the functional performance. So you right. could have need for OT and speech and mm -hmm. uh, you know, health related concerns. Yes. So each section would get this whole piece. The functional, the parent input and concern is for the whole functional performance area, but then the goal area you could have Communication, areas that fall OT, in and then under each of those goal areas, you could have numerous goals that right. are attached to it. Lisa, I do think part of my um, problem with my PowerPoint is I keep trying to check chat. So if you could check chat, then I won't. I've got, I've got it covered. Don't you okay. worry. Then I won't worry about messing it up. Okay. Okay, well, there we go. Okay, so now we are on to <clears throat> measurable goals and objectives. So we did talk about them going under the area that we're working on. There will be a goal and short-term objectives. There can be more, as you see in the objective section, if you have need more than three objectives. The nice thing about this new document is there is no real limit for characters. Something that we heard a lot on the old IEP is, well, we can only get so many words in that space. That space is not a problem anymore. It can be as long as it needs to be because it's not by page. So there can be, as Lisa said, more than one goal, more than three objectives. And then the two standards that are listed to align. Um, goals need to be measurable. Uh, what I understand is that when people are inputting goals into here, there will be prompts for the different areas to make sure that they are 
specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time defined. So goals are going to be looking different on some IEPs with all those components included. Um, and we still have the evaluation procedures and schedules for monitoring progress here. And just a little peek ahead, there is another whole rollout on this IEP. It will be not next year, I don't believe, but um, on progress monitoring. There's gonna be components added that make it clearer about your child's progress. But this is the, the, where we are this year at this point was with the new document. So transition planning. Transition planning is its own whole section. As Lisa mentioned earlier, it doesn't begin until your child's right in the PPT before their 14th birthday or earlier as appropriate. So it can be, be, begin earlier, but it must begin and must be written by the PPT before their 14th birthday. Um, and so that's what is transition planning. Transition planning is a coordinated set of, <clears throat> excuse me, set of activities that help a student um, well, we identify their needs for life after high school is really what we're talking about. They, we put together this coordinated set of activities. It's generally a high school based event. It can happen in the 18 to 22 year old range as well. Um, but we do this same way we do any other goal. We have to take evaluation data, we have to determine the child's needs, and then we also do a lot of work with the student to determine what their goals are. This should be student-led. This is really about what the student perceives their future to be, and our job is to help them get there. And you'll see there's a lot of questions. I'm going to tell you that transition is a huge area. When your child gets to be that age, if you don't have children that age, it should be um, a lot of discussion. And we do training, we could train for hours on the topic of transition. It's not something we're gonna get deep into here, but know that it follows the same process of finding their present levels, writing goals, writing statements that all support the student achieving their goals into adulthood. And we have more pages on, more sections. Um, so there are post-secondary outcome goal statements that need to be made for every student in these, the first two areas, post-secondary education or training and employment are for all students. Independent living skills is based on the student's individual needs. So not every student needs to have independent living skills statement. And then I mentioned that there are three places where parent and or student input is, cut, is documented. And that's when we get to the transition goals and objectives, just like the functional and academic sections, those are captured. So if you have specific thoughts about your child's future that you wanna share concerns, you know, will my child be able to live independently or will my child, child be able to get a job? This is where those concerns would go. This is also, when we say a huge topic, we have Transition Tuesday uh, that we, that we host at CPAC um, and it is specific to transition and it is, I think it's monthly, is it mm -hmm. once a month? Um, we have them recorded. If you go to our website, you can find our YouTube and you can find all the previous two transition Tuesdays that just gives the amount of information. I mean, this is really planning how your student or your child is going to grow into be as independent as possible. So you're gonna focus on independent living, academic, and work. So those are the three kind of big focuses that you'll talk about in transition time, but it's huge. So get ready. If your kid's yeah. about 12, 13, like mine is, we're starting to think about where to go with it. So. And it's it at any time, it's a good idea to talk to your child about their IP, let them know, because they can really be a good advocate for, gee, mom, I never knew why they were doing that with me before. Now that you tell me, I don't think it's worth the time. Like that's a really important thing when the student knows or to say, but when she does this, wow, that really helps me. You know, when that child can give that feedback to the team, it's, it's priceless. And so that's really what transition, the beginning of transition is just getting the student involved in their own learning and their own needs so that they can articulate and share with others. Um, it's a very powerful time. And I, I did, I wanna reiterate that I said, it's mandatory by their 14th birthday but it could start earlier. And so having a son myself with autism and intellectual disability, 
I, as soon as I learned about transition planning, I said, I'm starting now, whether the team was starting with me or not, but they were. And we just did in-school jobs. We did all kinds of things to help because I said, I know my son really well. And the word responsibility is not his favorite. And that as an adult, he's going to need to really understand that. And so at nine, he was delivering milk to the preschool. He was delivering newspapers to the teacher. He was understanding that there was value in work and it was really meaningful for his life. Because now at 32, he's happy to go to work every day. And that was my primary goal was that I didn't have somebody arguing with me every day about not going to work. Um, I think- And then this is the- the, the, up again. Sorry, I just wanted to, I think Talisha, did you have a question? Again, this is Marion Gracie. I want to ask, um, if from year to year, your transitions goals change at the annual PPTs, um, what, what do you do? Do you just say student change their mind? Um, well, it should be driven by the student. So, and students do change their mind. So you can document that the student has now expressed an interest in going to college that they didn't have before or expressed an interest in a, an area of study that they didn't before. So you can, but thank you for reminding me because there was another piece I wanted to talk about, which I think is a positive change. In the past, let's say the student was evaluated or did some assessments at 14 for their interest in inventory and what they wanted to, to do. Um, that gets documented on the IEP that year, and that will stay historically on the IEP document. So in the past, if you did evaluations years ago, you didn't really see that. So I think that will give you the history that you need to understand that maybe kids did change their opinion, they did change their direction. And then and you can do the, the notes of the meeting to document that as well, which is um, you know a separate document, but still available to people. That's a great question. Okay, and then I also would like to know um, who does the um, transition planning? Is it the case manager? It depends on the district. So some districts have transition coordinators, smaller districts, it might be a case manager. Um, I think that's a good question and you can ask for, you know, is there somebody in the district that's especially informed in the area of transition that might be able to help us? Okay, and one last question. Vary. You had said you started your son at nine years old? With my school team, they agree, right. at so that level. Yeah. When, can, when can a parent start asking for transitions planning? Well, I think that my son's team had no, no debate with me because they agreed that the word responsibility was not something he embraced on a regular basis. So I think it's a matter of saying why, you know, because the law right. says earlier as appropriate. So if you say, I have a demonstrated need here that this either it could be the severity of the disability as well that for my son I think it takes about four years for him to learn a routine you know okay. and so knowing that it takes a long time to start any new thing so those kinds of if you can support it with um reasoning then hopefully the team would embrace it with you okay thank you you're welcome and also, you can also start doing um, like responsibility for being able to art, like advocate for themselves as early as possible. My son is 11. He's dyslexic and epileptic and a bunch of other things. And he ran his entire IEP this past year. It was a transition from elementary to middle school. And he ran the entire thing with support. But because I want him to be able to talk about like, no, this is what I want and this is what I need. So how do we get there? Um, and starting that piece, because you know, he will grow up and I don't know, hopefully move out, but we'll see. Um, but I want them to be able to really articulate um, how to ask for things and how to share what he needs to be successful. So it could start that way as well at 11. And I think that's a really important piece, Lisa, because we start our kids learning this as early as possible, because when they get into the world of adulthood, they are, as Lisa talked about, 504 is really a, a civil rights law. So on, in the workplace, they can have accommodations if they disclose their disability and what they need in order to, as long as it doesn't, um, I forget what the word is in employment, but it can't be like a critical task that you do that you need, that you can't do in the way that it needs to be done. But generally, um, you know, if you needed to sit next to a window because you were asthmatic or you needed a certain um, keyboard because of your um, fine motor issues, that does follow you into the workplace. And so students need to be able to talk about what they might need in the workplace and know how to disclose appropriately what's a for college for college too, they have to be able to disclose. Right. 
Okay. Supplementary aids and services. All right, so let's talk about supplementary aids and services. They are there to enable a child to advance in attaining their goals, to participate in general education, to be educated alongside their neurotypical peers. Um, these are all specific and appropriate things that a child needs to meet their IEP goals. Um, there's accommodations and modifications. So there's a difference between those two. So people hear like accommodations and modifications and think they're the same, they're very different. Accommodations are made to instructions. They, it changes how the student learns. It could be changes to materials, environment. Um, it could be movement breaks, um, anything like that. Modifications are changes to what? the child is learning. So maybe they're showing that they're mastering this skill by instead of having a test with 50 multiplication questions, they're gonna do 30. Cause that's showing it's less, but it's still showing that they are able to do this skill. So it's changes to items. It could be um, different grading. That's a modification, um, things like that. Assistive technology is also in here, it's discussed for all students at this point. It used to only be discussed for students that um, really presented as needing assistive technology. Uh, now it is something on this new form that is discussed for all students that are receiving special education. Um, so I think that's a really great thing. So let's look at what it looks like, uh, please. Lisa, okay, after this we want to, there's a transition question. We oh, can go I'm back sorry, to. let's go back to the transition question then. Are you sure you want to just? Yeah, okay. no, please. Okay. Uh, can you use the transition planning IEP when attending college, vocational school, et cetera? Um, do you want to take that one or you want me? Can you read it again for me? Sure. Can you use the transition planning slash IEP when attending college, vocational school, et cetera? Okay, so an IEP is not usable at the college level. You can bring the IEP to the college to get a 504 plan, um, but there is no IEP at the college level. So again, to just revisit the difference, the IEP comes with specialized instruction. My son had a lot of difficulty with reading comprehension. So he had a lot of specialized instruction in reading comprehension. That is not available at the college level. There are colleges for students with disabilities that offer some add-on services or additional um, resources so that students can get additional support. But as a general rule, most colleges will, uh, if they're public schools, they have to allow for uh, public accommodations and the students to get accommodations, but they do not have to provide specialized instruction at that level. Do you think that answers it? Okay. I think so. Um, and then Ms. Rivera also said, she said she had accommodations through college, grad school, and it's not difficult to get. You just need a doctor's note, but of course, depends on the school. Yeah, you really have to be able to, this is where that self-advocacy piece comes in. And that's why we kind of always suggest starting young so that you can say, you know, I can't test in a room full of, of people. Like I can hear this pencil scratching. I can hear people typing. I get distracted. Being able to articulate what you need to be successful is really important at college level as well. So if you have those accommodations that are working for you in high school or middle school and you kind of carry them through, you just need to be able to really advocate for yourself with the colleges. Um, Who wants to add something? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, ahead, Laura. Okay. So I'm just going to reiterate that in November, we will be going through the transition section of the IEP and answer a lot of these questions. But at the college level, it's really important to know that the student really needs to self-disclose and they can bring any of the documents they have from high school, whether it's a 504 plan, they will get a summary of performance from the school by the end of their um, last year attending the school. So all that information is important to, to go to the college. And again, it's accommodations, not direct instruction and it be, can, can be given throughout their entire time in the while they're at the college. Laura, do you know the date of the that event? Yes, it is. Give me one second. I want to say, it, let me look at the calendar because it's the second Tuesday of the month and that will be November 8th. And Jennifer put the link in the chat. Beautiful, thank you. Okay. Um, Lisa, do you want me to move on to the next slide? Sure, sure, that'd be great. Um, and Veronica acts that modif modifications can be done anytime during the school year. And yes, if you're finding that something isn't working, you can make modifications and you can do it, add it to your IEP and then one of those amendments. Um, 
as long as the school agrees and the parents think it's uh, functional as well. The other, there was another question, if needed, when does BRS come into play? I think that's separate to education. Am I right? It can, they can come in um, with level up. They usually start services around the 16th birthday because they will do some job shadowing and other often they also wait until if the student is getting transition services only that means they're done with all their high school credits when they're in that transition program that it, from 18 to 22 brs will also get involved so it's important just connect with your school and ask them about inviting brs thank you i appreciate that laura um, so this is where you're this is the section that you're going to see your supplementary aids and services listed so your accommodation it'll have everything listed there, your modifications that your, this child needs to be successful. The assistive technology is new here. Um, it is definitely something that, um, again, it used to only be talked about for students specific to like dyslexia, um, who maybe needed talk to text or something like that. But now it is really a conversation about all students that are, have an IEP, which I really love. Um, and then there's the adult support piece, which is completely new. Um, and this is that the adult support that the child needs, where it takes place. So for example, my, my seven-year-old um, has autism and he has a one-on-one -on -one para with him throughout the day in all specials throughout the day. Um, and this is where I would find that. So we are going to find the adult support directly to the student listed here. Um, there's a different section we'll talk about something else, but we'll talk about that next slide. But I think it's really important that you say this is different because one of the calls we get a lot is, I think my child's supposed to have a para, but I don't know where to find it in the IEP. <laughs> Very and often. That, that, that I think we get the response to that question by them adding it to the IEP because we get that question all the time. So yeah. now it will be really clear. So I love that it's cut and dry. And if your child is a, has a para, it's going to be listed here. And there's like very clear expectations there. Um, then there's also a section for indirect services. Um, so indirect services are not direct services to the student. That's how they're indirect. So they're supports of uh, the classroom or consults from VCBA, they're um, uh, team meeting time, um, para training, any of those things, those are indirect services. They're gonna be listed under here. Again, these are not direct services to the student. These are the things that the support the staff needs, the support that the staff needs to implement this IEP to the best of their ability. Uh, there was a question. Yes, I wanted to know um, where it says supports required for school personnel to implement this IEP, where it says service goal, frequency, duration, and so on. Um, it used to be where there were numbers, you know, mm -hmm. just took place in the regular classroom as well as we'll say the um, learning disabled classroom. Yep. Now, how how is that going to be listed here? So if we go to the next page, Jane, I think it's on the next page, I can show you. Oh, I'm sorry, go to the next one, please. Then we can go back. So if you look at the bottom of this page, okay, it has, it has all the instructional two. site codes and that will be under the goal, the um, that that serves implementation and delivery. Okay, and then the the, amount of time will mm -hmm. just be written in longhand. It'll be frequency. So it all depends on the dis the, di the way that the district does it. Some will say, you know, hourly or whatever. Hourly or they'll right. do like a decimal. But it will be typed in. It but yeah, be it'll, be there. yeah. It'll, it'll be there. Yeah. It'll be specific. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Um, so that was our indirect services. Now let's look at what related services are. So when you think about related services, um, these are supports that the student needs to be successful. So it's speech and language, psychological services, PT or OT, physical or occupational therapy, counseling services, school health services, transportation and parent training and counseling. Please remember that you can get parent training and counseling. If your child uh, uses a, a, a device for communication, you can ask for parent training on that. That one's a big one that I think people forget about. I think also um, if your child has a behavior plan, sometimes mm -hmm. it's really nice to get some training on what the interventions are yeah. so you can repeat them at home. Yeah, and, and this that is not an exhaustive list. This is just an right. idea of what makes a related service. Yeah, related services, there can be so many others, but I love the consistency between home and school. So thank you for that. Um, and then this, is, this used to be the grid, the, the service grid. 
Um, now here you'll have special education services that'll be up top. So that'll be like their reading hours, their um, math interventions, whatever it is, is related is on top and the related services will be on the bottom. So that'll be where your OT, PT, uh, speech, counseling sessions, any of those things. So kind of like the non-academic areas will be on the bottom related services and the top will be your special education services. So those direct services of modified instruction will be listed here. And again, it has the, the goal ID. So it'll have the service, the goal ID it's tied to, uh, the frequency of how often it's happening, um, for how long, who's implementing it, who's responsible for it, the start and end date, which will be your IEP most likely, um, and all that good stuff. So if we can go to the next one, please. Um, and then here's your extended school year. Um, extended school year has its own section now, so it's no longer just a checkbox. Um, I like this because it says, are extended school year services required for this student? It's a simple yes or no. If it's yes, then it is, has your special education services as well as your related services listed for the time that they'll be attending ESY. Now there's a misunderstanding about um, ESY only being for students that are at uh, risk of regression, but there's more than one determining factor. So just keep that in mind. Um, and they're here. It's the nature of the student's disability, uh, like likelihood to lose critical skills or fail to recover the skills if once they lose it. Um, progress is critical in attaining self-sufficiency. Students' behavior uh, prevents the student from receiving educational benefit during the school year, um, and then other special circumstances. So it's not only if this child hasn't showed, you know, regression before, they can still attend, you know, ESY as long as they meet that other criteria or some of that other criteria. Right. So my son was not a regressor, and he didn't mm -hmm. have he didn't have issues with recoupment in the fall. But the severity of his disability meant he was always way behind his peers, and so he needed more yeah. time to learn. And yeah. so that was our, you know, was the severity of the disability that. It made him yep. eligible. And that's pretty common. And then transportation, it has its own little section. I love it. Um, and it's just simple yes or no. Does the student require transportation as related services? If no, that means that your child is going to be taking the gen ed bus that you see flying around when we're trying to get somewhere on time, which we're always late for because we get stuck behind it. If your child does require specialized instruction, it'll be checked here. It'll talk about um, what type of instruction, what, what type of supports they'll need. Maybe they need um, a booster seat, um, specialized equipment. Maybe the vehicle that they are in needs to have a lock for a wheelchair. Um, and then under it, it talks about vehicle requirements. Can they go in kind of like one of those, you know, um, car services or do they need a specialized van that is that has a lift for a student that uses a wheelchair? Um, and those will all be listed here. And this is, there was always a transportation section on that grid page that, yeah. you know, it was just hard to see. Yeah. but now it does, you know, it makes us have a deeper conversation mm -hmm. um, about what the student actually needs. And, and I have a student that really needed a lot more support on, on the bus behaviorally than he needed in during the school day. Yeah. So, so a monitor will be listed really here important. as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there was a question. I'm sorry. Uh, Go ahead. There's two student, questions. Oh, if a student requires a one-to-one -one specific transportation, will it be listed here as well? Yes, so it'll be listed under the supports. Um, it'll be listed under supports. The, this, this IEP form makes it so that you can get information in numerous places, which I really like, um, but it'll be listed here as well as on um, the frequency and supports. Um, and then so as a parent, I can request for training and communication device. Absolutely, Jessica. Yep. Lisa, there's a question about adult oh, support above those as well from oh, Veronica. Sorry, I missed it. Um, adult support during school. Can the support be for any one of the school or just people involved within his special education department? Um, I'm not really sure what you mean for any one of the school. So like if the lunch lady needed support in working with your child, I think that could be something that they put in there. Yeah. So anybody uh, working what, with the sorry, student. What I mean was, um, you talk about adult support. I think my mm -hmm. child will benefit from that. So I was thinking if he gets to talk to somebody within his special ed group, or he can be like, I think he will benefit, let's say, talking from with he have a 
one-on-one every week with his PE teacher per se or something like that. Um, so that's what I didn't know. Um, so then of, if, if you thought he needed a one-to-one, -one, that would go on the page that is a support for the child. Mm -hmm. if, if you think he would benefit from a, a parent in the classroom, that would go under the support for the teacher. But I think that it might be a conversation you want to call us and talk to us about. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, would, I would think that, that might we might be able to help you clarify a little bit more. Oh, yeah, I have many questions. In that. <laughs> yeah, I'll put the I'll put our email. I'll put my email in and we can schedule something if you'd like. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. OK, so now we're moving on to removal from the general ed environment. Um, this is as it as it sounds very descriptive is this is to describe if your child is being pulled from the general ed setting at all. And they need to document on the IEP what time they will be removed. And this is the total number of hours that the student is spending with non-disabled peers or without non-disabled peers. And that's all documented. You see the two layers because we're looking at, um, sometimes IEPs might be April to April. And so you could have a student in an elementary school finishing up and going starting in the middle school the next year. So those are for the different buildings that the child might be in. Or if you're a high schooler, you might have different courses from semester to semester. And so there's different reasons why we might want to pull that out. But they really want to see it across the entire year. Um, and then there's an explanation of the extent to which the student will not participate in general ed, non-academic, and the justification for removal. It's not really different from before, but will the student be removed from the environment for 60% or more of the time? If the answer is yes, the LRE checklist is required. And I don't know if everyone's familiar with the LRE checklist, but again, it's not part of the IEP system, but it's a it's a, this question triggers the use of that additional checklist. And it really should be done at the PPT for everybody in the meeting to answer the questions about the child's LRE. They're very unique to the individual child at that point in time. And so hopefully if this is a question you're at your annual IEP meeting, you can ask if a child is removed for more than 60%, let's do the LRE checklist. And then there's a, the question about at the time of this IEP implementation, will the student be living in a private residential facility? And that's just to clarify what the child's placement is and where and who made that placement at the bottom. So LRE is the expectation um, that students stay in the general ed setting to the maximum extent appropriate for them. It's their least restrictive environment is where they should be receiving their services. And so it's seen as general ed is the least restrictive environment for most students. And then based on their ability to stay in there with supplementary aids and services that Lisa just described to you, that hopefully they can stay more time. But some students really, because of the nature and severity of their disability may need to be pulled. But this is a very critical conversation. Students are expected to stay in general ed unless they can't be successful. Sometimes we get calls from kids who just really never get the opportunity to try. And so I think it's important that families understand that, that their child has a right to try unless there's some other really um, different evidence that tells us otherwise and they do get to try with the support of supplementary aids and services. And a para can be one of those. So now we're on to the state and district testing. Um, the English language profici proficiency assessment, if the student is identified as an English learner should be documented here. If the district is doing, and um, I think there's a, there's a, yeah, if the student is identified as a learner, they will participate in the alternate ELP assessment or the ELP. That needs to be determined. District-wide assessments is unique to every district. Some districts do assessments, some districts do not. This is not the SBAC or the SAT that would go under statewide assessments. And then if the child is taking a district-wide assessment, let's say everybody's doing, you know, assessment ABC, then if there are, if the child needs supports and accommodations, they need to be documented right under those district assessments. 
So statewide assessments pretty much applies to every kid third grade and up. And so if your child is in third grade or up, they sh this should be showing up. And again, remember, you don't get everything if it doesn't apply to your child. So if your child is not taking a district assessment, that would not show. Um, what grade will the student be in? It used to be a series of checklists that they would just check the grade and then you would do the accommodations. Now they're actually documenting um, specifically for the child, not a series of checklists. So the assessment name will be there. Um, the student will participate in a smarter balanced assessment is listed. Participation with accommodations, those are documented here. Um, and it, sometimes some students don't need accommodations. So participation without accommodations is an option. And I know I have a lot of parents who said, how can you have a student with disability who doesn't need accommodations on testing? It happens, it can happen. Um, and then there's the, the older next generation science assessments that will be documented. And again, any supports and accommodations. The purpose of this is to say, we know they're taking a test. What do they need to be successful on this test? We've applied all their needs to their course and their classroom work. Now we need to look at it in the, in the sense of the assessments as well. Then there's the CTAA, which is the alternate assessment, and it requires um, very specific criteria to be eligible for that. Um, less than 1% are supposed to be made eligible. There should not be more than that. And that's for students with um, more significant disabilities. And the student will um, participate in the CTAS, which is the um, science, um, same deal. They need to if they cannot participate in the standard, they can uh, potentially have the alternate assessment, but they need to be eligible. Um, I don't know, Jen, if you have it, I know you had it earlier, some information on this. If anybody wants it, there was a link to learn more about if your child is eligible. I just posted the flowchart link in the chat. Thank you. If there aren't any questions on that, and I can't see chat, so I can't tell you that, but no, Lisa says no. The transfer of rights I will move on to. At least one year before the student turns 18, the district must notify the student that all rights will transfer to them at age 18. This is currently in, in the previous IEP, but I think they really pulled it out to make it clear. I will tell you a lot of parents I've talked to have told me nobody ever had this conversation with them. And it's really important that parents know at 18, unless you have a child who's eligible for guardianship or conservatorship, power of attorney, that student gets their rights and they can sign a release for parents to stay involved or they can choose to keep you not involved. And that, um, those are also calls that we get that some students do not want their parent to remain involved because they don't always like the decisions they're made. If you think that might be your child, that's when we say start early working together because um, it's really hard if you get locked out at 18. And as far as I know, guardianship is only for intellectual disability. Conservatorship power of attorney can be for different disabilities. But it's really important to know that you do not have rights when they are 18, unless you opt into one of these other possible um, options. Progress reporting, that's this, almost the same as what's in the current IEP. The difference is a report of progress will be provided to the parents. There's no checkbox, there's no suggestion. So it can be monthly, it can be with every report card, it can be at the, whenever you're asking for it and the team agrees to produce progress reports. Most of the IEPs we see are with regular report cards it was the, what was checked in the past. And then resources at the bottom of the page are, procedural safeguards that parents always say, I could wallpaper my house with those, um, but they are required to be offered to you at every meeting. And then as your child ages, there will be different um, resources that need to be shared into the transition age. Oh, I, I like that. There's no image to show. This is on the um, <clears throat> uh, optional record of meeting, not record of meeting, sorry, that's actually a thing. Um, meeting summary. Meeting summary. Thank you. I can't see because sure. my, my thing is blocking it. Um, it's called the meeting summary. Currently, what we might be familiar with was the last IEP. It was on page two and it was just lines, but it said optional and it's still optional. 
It is not going to be embedded in your IEP, but if, the, if you and the district agree to take notes, it will be a separate document you can get out of the portal. And it is not a requirement. So if you really like that, you can ask for it. It is not, um, just because it's not part of the document doesn't mean it can't be done, but you might need to request it. So some of the changes. included taking the um, prior written notice document out of the IEP as well. It is identified in the law, but it is not identified as part of the IEP. It is required by federal and state special education law. It was supposed to, the, the intent of the new design was to support better understanding of actions proposed or refused by the district. Um, I think it's really important that people know that not every request is a prior written notice request. Prior written notice really applies to requests that are made about your child's program. So for example, if you wanted to make a request for something like, um, you know, a copy of something being sent home to you, that's not really what prior written notice, if they agree or not agree to send it home, isn't really what prior written notice is designed for. It's designed for changes in your child's program. So whether they're changing your disability category, the placement your child is in, um, some of the services that you're getting, those are the things that will be reported, not every request that you might make of the school. That sometimes gets confusing. Um, some information will be in narrative format, no longer check boxes. Again, hoping that the explanation is more detailed and people can have a better understanding. Uh, legally must be provided to the parent 10 days before the actions of the new IEP are taken. However, in Connecticut, we have a special um, regulation that allows parents to agree to start sooner and to waive that 10 day notice, but they must, parent must approve that. They must waive that. This is what the document now looks like. I can't say personally that I think it looks easier to read, but because it's a template in a data system, there are a lot of, um, for example, some of the check boxes are checked. The only way we could get a copy of it was they had to check those check boxes in order to print it. So they're just checked because they want we wanted a copy for our presentation. Um, but I think when they're actually filled with the information, hopefully it will make it easier for everybody to understand what the reason of the proposed or refused action was, which is where a lot of um, misunderstandings can occur. This is the bottom of that. So it's the same. Um, and it does give you your information about what to do if you disagree. Parents have a right to disagree with what is being proposed. You will see our phone number is listed there. Our email is listed there. And uh, our toll free, which a lot of people aren't able to access with cell phones. We have a regular number as well. Um, so that information will be right on your child's IEP if you want to take any action, you have some good resources to know how to do that. One of the other documents that is not part of the IEP, but part of the IEP process is the record of meeting form. Um, this is when the IEP does not change in any way. So for example, a referral PPT that does not result in an agreement to evaluate. So I refer my child and they say, gee, that really does not seem like a disability. We don't, we think we could try this service and we're not even gonna evaluate right now. Then just the record of meeting would be filled out. Um, the manifestation determination, that's a um, special right for students with disabilities in the world of discipline. And if a manifestation determination meeting has to take place, place. It doesn't always result in a change of the child's IEP. It is really a review of the behavior. And so that would come out in a re record of meeting form. If, if your child is experiencing periods of excessive restraint and seclusion, the law outlines in Connecticut what that means. I don't know the details off the top of my head, but for example, something like four restraints in a month would trigger a PPT. If people are interested in that, I promise we can get you that. I just don't know it off the top of my head. Um, and that would trigger a meeting that would not, again, necessarily result in a change of the IEP, might result in a change of a behavior plan or something else. Um, or if you just want to do a program review, make sure everybody's on the same page, we know what's going on, we all understand the IEP. Again, no changes, record of meeting would suffice, not a complete, complete new IEP. 
And this is what that document looks like. You'll see that it still has the content that we, Lisa showed you at the beginning of the meeting date, reason for meeting, the members who were there, but now it's just gonna tell you what happened at the meeting and why it didn't result in a change to the IEP and what the recommendations are. Thoughts, questions on that? We do have a question, we have a hand up. If you wanna unmute. Uh, yes, hi, Mary and Gracie again. Um, I wanna ask you with regards to a parent's request for testing. Um, in the past, I know that a PPT was held and if the parent by the end of the meeting still wanted to have testing and had it in writing, the school was required to do that. Is that still something in place? That's part of idea. And that's when you're talking about a triennial specifically. No, no, no. I'm talking about an initial testing. So oh, I'm sorry. Have... I, I don't know it's true in initial testing. I know it is true in triennial testing. Oh, but yeah, I know that. But I don't, I don't know that. I don't believe it to be true in initial, but it's something we'd be happy to look into with you. Yes, if you could. And also, um, I know that in the past it was you know required if the parent had said it. And then the other question was, from the date of request, how many school days before testing is done? Do you know that? Um, it doesn't, it's it's not like that because the request would be made at PPT. Right. So well, that's what I mean. From the, the date of the PPT, if, if evaluation is agreed at, at PPT, in Connecticut, it's a 45 day timeline. 45 day school days, right? 45 school days. And that includes not only that the testing takes place, but that the PPT determining eligibility is also takes place in that timeline. Okay. And so you don't know about the first question about asking for time. Uh, I've never heard it before. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I'm not familiar with that. I do know. I just actually was reading about triennials yesterday and I, you know, the parent can still say, I want it. The team could say, and my son's triennial when he was about 15 the whole team said it. We don't think we need information right now. We've got really good information. Just was it necessary? But I know that if I wanted to say, oh, I really wanted to look at his fine motor, they would have had to agree to do that. I do. I just don't ever remember hearing about that in initial. But you know, we don't pretend to know everything, so I'm happy to look into it. Okay, because I work with a lot of children who um, have not been diagnosed but have problems in school that require testing, and then because of the testing, then it's it's documented that they need the services, um, but many have gone way beyond having been picked up, and so it's been picked up by the request by parent asking for testing, mm -hmm. and, and then gone to a PPT where where you know it was all discussed, and if the parent at the end of the PPT still was adamant about having the testing, that the testing had to be done. I just wondered whether or not that had had changed. Yeah, it, it sounds like that might have been more of a practice in a building. And it's actually, I like the practice because a parent who really feels that there's something there may not always articulate what they're seeing, but that they're pretty certain that there's something going on. And so I like the practice. I, I just don't know it as a legal requirement. So it was not a practice just in the building. It was statewide. Okay. It used to be. So I, I don't know if it's still a statewide issue but okay if you well, we will up, we will look into it and get back to um thank the you. folks at favor who can get back to you guys thank you sure oh it's that time we're getting near the end of our presentation and we do have a um a link lisa's going to put in the chat for you guys to let us know how we did um it shouldn't take very long if everybody would do it would really help us so we really appreciate it um, and that link will be accessible for the rest of the training. So let me move on, but you have access now. So putting it all together, the IEP is the primary vehicle for describing the student's needs and strengths. That's a great thing for parents to work on is really describing. One of the things Lisa does is a, a training for very young parents um, about understanding their, their students' strengths and needs, because very often at early PPTs, when parents aren't as practiced, they might come to the table and say, my child has autism or my child has whatever disability, and that's not really descriptive. And so we really wanna to talk to parents about describing what they see and really being able to turn that into present levels in the IEP. Um, and so that's a really big strength for parents to be able to describe. And also the IEP is going to define appropriate services and supports that the team agreed on. 
And so that's what you should be able to find in the IEP. All those should be documented. If they're not in the IEP, I would basically say, don't expect them to be happening because that is the legal document that commits the district to those services. And then it also monitors the student's progress towards meeting those goals. That's a really important discussion to have. Sometimes you can see progress and you know it's happening and sometimes it's harder to tell. So it's always important to have that conversation. And, and if your child's not making the progress everybody expects, it's okay to go back to the drawing board and say, what should we do differently? How do we change this IEP so that they do improve their progress? Or maybe we learn over time, my, my child makes progress, but it's slow. Those are all important things to know and to discuss and the IEP helps you to do all of that. And at the end we have, for more information, we always recommend you contact your school district, whether it's your case manager and ask direct questions about what's happening there. We're available and the State Department of Education is available to answer your questions as well. One thing I don't think I said today, and I didn't see it in my notes, but I'm sure was, is that for you guys who have not yet had this new IEP, it is expected to be used at your annual this year, your triennial this year, if you have one. Um, and for anybody who's initial, the new IEP would be used this year. So many people, if you don't have a child whose um, annual is till February or March, you're still on the old IEP document. But what we talked about today, all the components of the IEP, they're still all the components of the IEP. Present levels of performance through evaluation and classroom assessment should guide what the goals and objectives are. Parents should get information about how the student's doing on those goals and objectives. Those are all part of the same process that you are familiar with. It's just going to look a little bit different in its organizational structure. So um, I, I, I was just gonna, oh, sorry. I was just gonna mention that um, at CPEC, we have um, a program for families or professionals. It's kind of like an eight week crash course. Um, it's called Next Steps. We have one starting in October. It's only offered twice a year, it's virtual. Um, and it is great if you are at the beginning or in the middle of your special education journey. I think it's really beneficial. It talks about all of these things specifically. It's a great program. Most of us that work there started out and in next steps, that's where we got our first initial exposure to as much information as we can. Um, so if that's something Jen was kind enough to just put the uh, link in there, I'm the coordinator for it. So I would do a lot of the presentations, not all of them, don't worry, you get other people too. Um, but it's a great program to get as much information and then we can kind of get into much more specifics as well. Um, so it's just also an um, we do have um, bilingual staff who present mm -hmm. the same training in Spanish. Yep. And so if anyone would prefer the information in Spanish or have friends or family, um, we also can do it. Lisa is not the primary coordinator for that, Kiyomari Sotillo is, um, but we can get you connected to, to the bilingual staff to get um, a Spanish Next Steps enrollment as well. So thanks. Um, we are trying to do all of our training uh, in English and Spanish, and where not possible, we're trying to do the um, live interpretation in Spanish for folks. So that is something we're trying to do more of and we'd love to hear feedback on that. Otherwise, I think we have hit all of our slides and I'm going to stop share and see if people want more questions or if Anne has anything she wants to get into. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, before we um, wrap up the meeting, um, I have a few things to share, but I wanted to, um, before diving into that, I wanted to make sure that um, we had a chance for people to um, ask questions or um, anything like that. So I do see um, a, a raised hand. If you want to come off mute. Okay, this is Mary and Grace again. Um, I don't know whether or not it was something that I should have done before, but I think it would have been really helpful for to have had all these papers um, ahead of the meeting so that we could have taken notes on them. Just as a FYI, you know, you mean the PowerPoint? Of, yes. Okay, thanks. Because um, I've written all over uh, uh, <laughs> my papers, but I would really, if I had had them right then and there, I, it, you know, I could have taken notes on them. So just in the future, if if people who are going to be attending these 
have the PowerPoints ahead of time, I think would be a really wonderful thing. And thank you for what you did. I appreciate it. Thank you for the feedback. We appreciate that. Please reach out to us if you have questions. So reach out to CPAC. We are happy to help. That's what we're there for. So please don't hesitate, okay? Veronica? Hi, um, I, since you say, please reach out. Um, how, I'm on your website. Do I refer to any of your specific emails? Like, or like, it's a lot of you. So um, I didn't know where exactly to. So uh, the best way to get the, the quickest answer is to send it to our main box, which is CPAC at CPACinc.org. And that way okay. it'll get to somebody same, you know, same day. You probably get a response within uh, 24 or 48 hours. And Jen just posted the number and the email again in the chat. Thank you. You're welcome. And we're so glad you're going to reach out. Any more questions? Johanna, did you want to ask? Hi, Jen. Hi. I uh, just want to make sure if I have access to this recording in your website. I was not be able to see all the presentation, but I really looking to. I'm not so, sure you'll be able to put. Yeah, Anne is going to send us the recording and we're going to put it on YouTube. And Keo and Joviana are doing it in Spanish right now. That one's going to be up there too. Okay. So Thank you, you, you Jane. You're going to have to give us a few days, but we'll get it up there. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think we're good. Veronica, do you have another question or is your hand just still raised? Sorry, no, I'm, I don't have another question. Either. Okay. Stay high. <laughs> All right, well, I know that um, we are over time. So, um, but first I just wanna thank you guys, um, everyone from CPAC. This was a really, really informative presentation. You guys did such a good job um, just explaining this and, in a way that was easy for, for all of us to understand. So we really, really appreciate it. Um, if um, anyone who signed up for this meeting uh, with their email, we will send the slides out afterwards um, and also we'll share where the recording is going to be posted. Um, so you can share that um, with um, your colleagues or your community, fellow community members or parents, caregivers whoever you think that the information would be helpful for. Um, I just wanted to um, just put the plug out that we do have the Greater New Britain Community Collaborative and Greater uh, Bristol Farmington Community. It's a combined collaborative right now, but that is tomorrow. Um, so, and we are going to have um, some presentations in the upcoming months at that collaborative. So if you are interested in attending, we would love to have you. Um, I also am going to put my email in the chat right now. Um, because uh, this is a network of care meeting and we would love to um, have folks join our, our network of care. And if they're interested in joining our network of care leadership, um, we would love that as well. So um, the next central network of care leadership meeting is on October 21st. So if you're interested in joining, um, please uh, shoot me an email. Um, and if you have any other questions as well, feel free to reach out. Um, do you have a question, Veronica? No, I just don't know how to put the hands on. Oh, I'm, oh sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't. I didn't know um, that it was still up. So yeah, if anybody, if anyone has any more questions, let us know. If not, um, we will wrap it up. But again, thanks so much to everyone at CPAC. You guys did a phenomenal job, and um, this was really, really great. So we we appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much.